Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Digital Rebar Provision Community Meetup. We are on edition number 40, believe it or not, 40 versions of this fantastic, amazing show that hopefully you haven't missed any of. If you've missed some of them, we've got lots of, uh, all of them archived and available for your review. If you're bored at night sometime and like some uh, help getting to sleep, you can review all of our uh, meetup videos. <laughs> Today we have a fabulous, agenda on tap. We have some demonstration by Greg on the rack end side to do callback, a demo on callback. Greg is saving my bacon because I got started on configuring the callback demo, which I had agreed to do. So we can all thank Greg for saving Shane's bacon. And then uh, David Young uh, from Funky Penguins down under or down under or Kiwi, I'm sorry. I know if I get that wrong, you'll get offended at me. Uh, down, yeah, down under. So, um, down, down under. Okay. No, 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 can, you know, can the we whole Kiwis and you know we, we, Australians we, we, and. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> Australians are like the west coast of New Zealand. So. Awesome. Okay. David Young has been hacking away like crazy on the Kubernetes uh, components that we have, Crib, and he's been contributing a huge amount. Uh, recently to hardening it and um, adding a lot of additional functionality and capabilities. He'll show us a demo of some of the things he's been working on. And then we will move over to a discussion on Terraform. Uh, many people are interested in the Terraform provider that we have. It's been a, a relatively popular component within Digital Rebar Provision. It's currently in what we consider our V1 state, uh, but we also consider it to have a lot of problems and needs help. And we are working on a V2 version of that. And we wanted to discuss with the community uh, ideas, thoughts, structures, architecture, what we're thinking, where we're going, and uh, garner input from all of you. All right. So that's sort of a kickoff there. Um, I totally skipped in introductions. Uh, Shane, with the Racken team, we've got uh, Michael Rice, Rob Hirschfeld, uh, Greg Althaus, uh, Isaac Hirschfeld, and Victor Lowther on the call, I think, in the background with Greg. Um, and we have a nice uh, selection of folks from the community, old and new. So for all of you oldies that have been around, floating around, uh, thank you for coming back. Uh, for those of you who are new, this is an amazing experience. It's going to be life-changing and altering for you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, with that said, I'm going to cut things over to Greg. Greg, you are going to show us cool stuff. Uh, I'm going to stop my share and let you take over. Um, to, to set the foundation for what Greg is going to be showing, we have a tool or plugin that we call Callback, uh, very um, niftily named. Um, Callback is a distillation of our experience working with a number of very large customers that wanted to integrate with infrastructure uh, that they had. And so a lot of these shops uh, had custom systems or record or asset management databases or services they wanted to integrate with. And we would build a, a custom plugin for them to do that integration. They would then be able to integrate their workflow with their thing. And one of the things that we found over time is, well, pretty much everybody's implementing a RESTful API-based service. And one of the beautiful things about RESTful things is there's a pretty um, well-known structure to it. And coming from that experience with multiple customers, multiple infrastructure services, uh, there was a common use case pattern, which has been sort of congealed down into what callback is, which is a generic capability to call out to other services. And you can flexibly define all kinds of cool things about it. I'll let Greg fill in um, the exciting details on that aspect and what we're doing there. Um, but essentially, it allows us to create uh, dynamic interactions uh, as configuration uh, with a single plugin instead of writing individual plugins for every single service. And that is unmaintainable for a lot of reasons because a lot of customers change their services and their service endpoints, and that puts the burden on the plugin uh, code to be able to adapt to that. So the callback plugin moves that to an easily uh, referenceable um, configuration text, JSON information. So it's a lot easier to adapt the callback plugin. Uh, Greg, uh, all yours. So to get the callback plugin, you go to the catalog and select callback. 
uh, load it, it has no dependencies. Uh, what it will add is some initial um, stages. We take advantage of the um, ability to put parameters on stages. And so if, for example, uh, callback complete, the idea is if you put this stage in a workflow, it will uh, do the complete callback and we'll kind of show you through that. It has a single task. The task is actually pretty straightforward. It calls the action, the callback do action, specifying the callback action that you want to take. Uh, optionally, it will let you specify which plugin uh, instance you want to handle that callback, and we'll show you that in a minute. But the idea is it's fairly straightforward. Anything that the callback returns from its API is printed to standard out, okay? So that allows you to create these milestones. So what I've done for our test purposes is created a workflow that is just basically our basic discover. We're apparently gonna call complete a couple of times. Then we're going to call a couple other callbacks and then you just go back to sledgehammer wait. So what I've done is I've created a little Go service that's just basically going to receive a bunch of callbacks and print when that's re received with data. So I'm going to run that server. And just to kind of show what happens, I'm going to rerun this workflow. And so it goes through the process. And so now we start getting the callback data. And in this case, I have a couple of callbacks configured, specifically the other side, and let's see, hit me are configured right now. The idea is that I don't have to configure all the callbacks. The idea is I can put the milestones in place, and if the plugin doesn't have the configuration to generate the callbacks, they're not done. So you can see here, we're gonna change stage. When we change these stages, those parameters on the stage become available on the machine. And then when we transition out of that stage, those parameters disappear. And then we can use that same task over and over and over again to generate different callbacks to different systems. Now, configuring the callbacks is done on the plugin itself. The idea is that I may have a secure service that I want to send these callbacks against, or I don't necessarily want the endpoint to have that data. So that's what this is providing. So the callbacks are configured. Um, using an object. So you define the callbacks that you want this plugin to handle. Since I've named it callback, that's the default. So the hit me stage is gonna call hit me. Um, in this case, I have two plugin providers. This allows you to have two sets of callbacks potentially managed by two different groups so that you could have one for one set and one for another. The other side generates that. The callback system um, allows you to do posts, puts, gets. You define what the callback is. You give a URL. Um, you can even do auth, and I'll show you some of that here in a second. The idea is that you're posting a machine object to a service that can then do whatever they want with it. And so by default, the full object is sent. Um, to keep my screen from just exploding with stuff, you can also specify um, that you want certain parameters excluded. So in this case, I told it to exclude the GoI inventory and the LDAP information, so it's not being printed, but you could alter that. In this case, my system, my first callback runs, there's my machine object. At the moment, the callback runs. The idea is that as the system's going through the workflows, you can send the machine objects to specific locations with the data that's associated with it. Um, once that's for that, so that's that plugin for, or callback, for example. And the other one, I've also added the aggregate flag. So in this case, it's not only sending the machine itself, but it's also aggregating it all the parameters that were associated with it, so that you can get the like SSH keys is on my global setup, so that's getting sent as an aggregated parameter. Um, the excludes runs after aggregate, so if you were worried about sending certain 
passwords or other stuff like that, you could extract them or exclude them from the system. It also allows you to specify decode set to true. The idea there is if you have secure parameters, by default, the parameters will sent, be sent encrypted across, which the receiver can't decode without getting a key from, uh, well, at all. They have to re-ask DRP for them decrypted. So you can actually set decode set to true, and that will decode secure parameters in the object that it sends on. The callback structure that you can build basically allows you to specify a URL, a method. So if you needed to do a put versus a, a post, you could do that way. You can even do, and I guess I'll save that for a second. You can specify retry and timeouts where uh, you can say retry this a certain number of times because the service wasn't ready or whatever. And then after a certain number of seconds, timeout. You can also specify a delay between retries so that you can get, um, you don't just hammer your upstream system. If your upstream system requires certain headers, you can specify the headers that way. And then, like I said, the actual parameters that let you alter the machine object that you send back. That defines a callback. The last one I missed or skipped was auth. Auth allows you to specify the name of an auth type, okay? This allows you to define like a basic authentication structure or um, if you have something that will turn a, return a JSON blob upon authentication, you can do that as well. So if you're doing basic auth, you can have that send um, username and password. Uh, that'll get rolled into the request and sent as a basic auth request. Um, in that case, you could even, you can do HTTPS in the URL string, so it's a full URL, um, including query parameters, by the way. So in the URL, you can specify your query parameters you wanna use. Um, if you had a service that was able to provide you um, a JSON blob that had like a token in it, um, you can specify the URL that you wanna hit for that, the method, data needed to generate that authentication, additional query strings if you need to send that on the URL. And then that also has retry timeout and delay capabilities. And then um, you can specify the two JSON fields um, optionally. Well, you have to specify the token field. That will be pulled out of that JSON blob as the token that should be then sent um, in the header for as a bearer token for the upstream auth system. Um, but those are configuration. Those, I think, show up in the docs for that. If not, we'll need to fix that. But, but that's the general idea of the callback plugin and how that works. So, um, yeah. Um, as with all the systems, the jobs will show the callbacks. In this case, since my service is returning nothing right now, you get nothing, but uh, actually you get the JSON string of nothing. But um, if you could also write your own custom um, task that could take that output from the callback. So say you wanted to get some information from a service, um, you could, instead of doing a post with data, you could do a get and the get would then potentially use the machine object if you wanted or a post and then get data back either way. And then have that JSON printed out and then use like JQ to process it and then store that on the machine or other stuff. But that's kind of like an advanced use of the callback system so that you didn't have to necessarily write your own plugin. Okay. Any questions? As I so Greg, it. thank you. Um, I have a couple questions I wanted to tee up, uh, but first I just wanted to mention, you mentioned the aggregate thing. That's a very important thing. Uh, for those of you who don't know aggregate, aggregate takes the value of all of the parameters that are on a machine. So if you set a parameter on a machine, that's a value that you'll see on the machine object. It's easy to see. But if you set a profile on a machine also, and that profile contains a bunch of parameters, on the machine object, you only see the profile itself. 
Uh, the aggregate allows you to have the system take all of the values of the parameters in all of the profiles, including the global profile and the individual parameters, and provide all of those in one aggregate chunk so you can see all of the parameters that are affecting the machine in one JSON structure that returns back. It's an important distinction because a lot of times people get hung up on the, where did this come from? Oh, right, it was in a profile and you don't actually see it on the machine object unless you go click into the, the profile if you're using the UX. But from a uh, service interaction standpoint, it's important to understand and remember the aggregate is probably or often what you're going to want to add. Uh, regularly to see all of the parameters that can affect the machine. Um, Chris has a, uh, is this like the mechanism that the runner uses but allows to point to another service? Um, kind of, but not necessarily. The idea is that um, the server is making, or more accurately, the callback binary on the on the endpoint is making the request. The machine isn't. The idea is that this allows you to isolate the machines if there's like a network separation or um, security separations, so that the machine itself doesn't take the action. So the runner is, if you think about it, is doing API requests against the endpoint. The callback mechanism is a request to the endpoint to do this callback on behalf of the runner. The runner isn't actually sending any data. Um, the, the callback is looking up the machine, it's building the aggregate data, and then processing it. So they're disjointed in that regard. It, it allows us to reduce the required trust on the runner and the machine. and, and and defer that to the endpoints so that it can be more secure. Um, a relay, yeah, you could think of it as a relay, though the, there's a lot of translation going on, right? It's basically saying, do A with B, and then the callback is translating and looking up all the proper security credentials and all the other stuff for that and, and generating the appropriate setup, so. There you go. So that's so it's it's kind of you can think of it as a relay, but it's not really. <laughs> okay. All right, Shane, your questions. Yeah. So one of the things that when someone first moves into playing around with a callback, and the default within the UX exposes a couple of things that you want to configure. You have callback callbacks, callback offs, and callback actions. Um, offs is relatively self-explanatory. It defines the different authentication uh, methods that you need to use to interact with a remote uh, RESTful service. But can you just briefly cover what callback so, callbacks is versus callback actions? Okay, so there's five callback parameters. Callback auths and callback callbacks are used by the plugin object to define what should happen for callbacks and auths. Callback proxy is also used by the plugin if a proxy server is needed to access the endpoint. So the idea is that your endpoint may need to be bounced through a proxy. So this allows you to specify what the proxy URL is that then gets, that can process your outbound URLs. Um, in general, you, hopefully you don't need that. Then the other two are used on the stage to define what callback should be, which callback plugin should be used. So that's what this callback plugin is, and it defaults to callback. So if you use the normal setup and callback configuration, it'll the system will encourage you to name the plugin after the provider. And so that way all the defaults will work so you don't have to specify it. Um, and then the callback action is the one that actually defines what action should be taken. So it's the one that's saying call the hit me plugin and stuff like that. And so it's the thing that maps the stage to the actual entry in the table. So this hit me here would be the value of the callback action parameter on the stage. Oh, okay, perfect, thank you. Um, any other questions from community? Okay. Well, let's awesome. Uh, David Young. 
Bracken oh, calling hi. David Young. Are yeah, you there, um, David Young? Yes, yes. yes. All right. New Zealand answering. <laughs> we're, we're still here. Uh, right, so uh, I'll just talk a little bit about the changes we've made to, to Crib to support a workflow that I'm, I'm building. Uh, I'm working with another Greg uh, to try and build a uh, bare metal Kubernetes cluster, uh, but we needed something that was more robust than the default Crib install, something that was highly available, and then we needed to add on other things like um, secret management and logging and so on. So we took the, the standard crib and we started adding extra optional um, stages. The first stage we added was we, we decided we should make etcd highly available. Uh, so on a, on a HA crib install by default, uh, it's, it's a race to finish first. If, if you say I want to have three masters, the first three nodes to finish will become the masters. Uh, in our case, we we kind of had different hardware for our masters versus our workers. So we wanted to be able to nominate a, a master must be uh, explicitly determined by a profile. Let me show you my screen. It'll make a bit more sense. Um, you guys can still hear me? You've gone very quiet. Um, yep, okay, cool. So you're good. You can hear you and see you. Excellent. All right, here we go. So this is perfect. Uh, you can still see that? There we are. So in this case, I, you see I've got four nodes and I've got three masters. Each master has an additional profile, which basically says I am a master. Um, and on all the stages where there's, there's, there's a, a level of mastership involved, um, we check for, for the existence of that master profile, uh, which means I, I can bulk select all of my machines at once, tell them to install. The machines I've designated as master will become master, uh, and the other ones will just skip all those stages. So once we got that working, um, what else do we do? Uh, small variation to the way etcd worked uh, is the Kubernetes API itself sits behind HA proxy, so that you have one API that you hit, one IP address you hit for the API. You can turn down a master, turn it up again. Uh, there's no difference. The original way that crib worked was that you'd have multiple IPs, one for each etcd member. Uh, Technically, there's probably not a lot of um, difference to having three etcd masters versus one HA address, but it made more sense to use HA proxy um, so that you'd have one IP for etcd, one IP for the, the Cube API. Uh, it gets more interesting. That, that was kind of boring. But the, the next challenge was, uh, well, what do we do about the fact that etcd default is not encrypted? So there's a big hoo-ha about... Uh, Kubernetes secrets are not actually very secret because all they are is base64 encoded and slapped into etcd, which is stored in plain text in the file system. Um, and the answer is kind of convoluted because you, you have to keep your secret somewhere. So we started building out this um, uh, layers of, of where do you store your secrets. Uh, if you want to use HashiCorp Vault, that's cool, but you need to have that in HA mode. Uh, HashiCorp Vault needs somewhere to store its secrets, which is highly available. So now you need to have console in the background. Uh, and then unless you do extra work, uh, Vault needs to be unsealed manually by an operator with a password every time you reboot the machine. So with three machines, one reboot, you're always gonna have some going back and, and unsealing the Vault. So we, we built on a couple of workflows, one to install an, an HA console installation to the masters. Uh, and then on top of that, we install a console agent because technically your console servers and your console agents could be on separate nodes if you had a big enough cluster. Uh, so you've got console servers, console agents. On top of that goes Vault. And the, the, the icing on the cake is that Vault allows you to do auto unlock now as of December uh, against a KMS like uh, AWS. So, so the tip of our pyramid here is, is Amazon KMS we have a key, which I will show you here. Here's my vault key. Uh, in, this, in this case, it's enabled, but what I could do under BAU circumstances, I would disable this key. So now my dude, there's no more auto unlocking. If somebody steals my node now, plugs it in somewhere else, they, they won't be able to trigger the auto unlocking feature. But when I'm ready or during BAU routines, I'd enable my key. Now I can restart any one of the nodes I can restart all three of the masters and on startup, 
Council will start, establish a leadership and a quorum. Vault will start on top of that. Vault knows it's in HA mode. Uh, and and Vault, using the IAM user that I've given it, will retrieve this seal key from AWS KMS, unlock it, oh, and we're back in business. Uh, let me show you quickly a little demonstration. As soon as I find it. This is going to be super boring, this one, but it sets the scene. Oh, the other problem that we had, it's a pain in the butt to have to reinstall the OS every time you, you rebuild your cluster. It takes about 10 minutes. So we came up with a, a soft reinstall. Uh, this is not the soft reinstall. This is just, uh, this is going from a, a fully configured cluster and running a reset. Uh, there it goes there. What the... What the reset does now is what it always did. It, it wipes out um, GRP's memory of uh, our cluster, all the parameters we've set, all the certificates. Uh, but then it also wipes out all the elements on the local OS that um, were deployed, like the, all the containers, all the config. And in the case of Ceph, it, it also um, wipes our disks so we're ready for a new Ceph installation. Skipping ahead here, you see this, this video takes four minutes. All the nodes except one of them finish pretty, there we go, this one This one stays behind. The reason that the, the, the worker nodes take longer than the masters to reset is because of the Ceph resetting business. Um, we're just being very, very blunt and saying, if you've targeted this particular block device as a um, Ceph storage node, just kill it, just wipe it out, zap it. Um, and that causes a little bit of delay sometimes as, as the process is killed. There's a reset, and then, more interestingly, when I find it again, because I've lost my window. All right, here's an install. This, I'm gonna zip through this one. This took 16 or 15 and a half minutes. Uh, this, you see I installed all four machines, all, all seven machines at once. The masters would have finished first because they're slightly faster, but also I nominated them as masters. Why is my scrolling not working here? Oh, there we are. Uh, okay, so here we're getting interesting. Um, Oh, here we go. In, in the beginning, we replaced Docker with container D. Step one, that, that was cool. Um, and, uh, and and my Greg did a lot of work on hardening the um, CentOS install with some CIS benchmarks to, to make it more secure by default. Uh, it's a pain in the butt sometimes because now there's a mandatory logout if you leave your session open, which is good, but a nuisance. Every time I go back to the, the session, it's logged me out. Uh, but yes, so we start off, we install uh, container D, we install Kubernetes, and then etcd, here it comes, yeah, console. And then vault. You would be familiar with the whole keep alive thing. <laughs> uh, runs. Now we wait for a long time for the nodes to catch up. And then only this, see master node two here with the purple anchor, he's the one who's, who's gonna do the, the final bits of, of master configuring. Uh, he sets up logging. Uh, we added uh, fluent bit um, daemon set. So every node uh, sends all the container D logs into a gray log instance, which I will show you. Uh, we updated uh, metal LB. So that instead of, or well, in addition to layer two load balancing, we can now do layer three load balancing with um, uh, BGP. If your firewall in front of your deployment supports BGP. Uh, external DNS, which uh, if properly configured will automatically expose your, in or create DNS records for your ingress hosts. 
this this step here, this nginx till list takes a long time because it's deploying um, the nginx ingress, but not using tiller. So we've moved away from tiller in Helm 3. We've tried to avoid using it at all here. Um, and then it deploys cert manager. Uh, and cert manager has this webhook that it uses to to pre-validate any certificates you give it. It's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. Uh, cert manager has to be running to apply its own certificates, which it sort of gives itself a, a pass for. But um, we've also tainted our masters. So the masters won't run normal workloads, which means I need to have workers up in time to run the webhook for cert manager for, so the cert manager can continue. So this Nginx till this install takes a while and I use the, the back off uh, function um, that comes with the crib utilities or the crib libraries to um, continue the back off as it retries. Eventually this will succeed. Once the webhook is happy, it's, it's got quite a big back off now, so it's taken a while and, and we're done. So total install time was 15 and a half minutes. Uh, yeah. and, and what we have now is we have, we have logging. Let me show you my logs. If I can drive my own machine. Oh, here we go. Uh, hang on, too many windows. Oh, yes. Okay, one. Oh, well, this is this here is the, the, the result of um, external DNS. So uh, because we're running a lot of this stuff on uh, private IP ranges, we're, we're not sort of publicly exposed and we didn't want to use uh, wildcard sets. So external DNS runs in by default what's called upsert mode. So updates and inserts records, but it never deletes them. And as you can see, I've been messing around with Jenkins X. And so for every single ingress I've created, it's gone and made me um, an A record and a text record. But it's really handy that you can spin up a new um, service, um, a new ingress, and that's it. Uh, the DNS is done for you and the load balancing is done for you uh, using Metal LB. I'll stop now and ask for questions. And if you want to, I can show you the, the, the gray log, um, the, the logging that spools through and the Ceph cluster that gets built uh, and other things. Uh, David, that's awesome. There's a lot of work you've done there, obviously, and a lot of foundational pieces that you've put in there. We've talked about um, previously, uh, the console vault pieces would be nice to pull out as a separate set of components and then can just be added in as stages into a workflow since those are very useful, reusable pieces. Um, but the general question I had for you is you're currently layering a lot of um, services and master service work on three physical machines. So you've got Vault, Console, uh, Kubernetes, you've got a whole, you know, etcd, you've got a whole pile of services running there. Are those individual services in the rework you've done uh, able to be pulled out and specify different sets of servers. So maybe you want to do etcd on these three servers and your Kubernetes masters on these three servers, for example. Uh, right now we've got a distinction of I'm a master or I'm not. Okay. Um, theoretically, each clustered set of hosts has its own election to decide who gets to be the boss. So um, if you had if you nominated nine nodes to be masters, the first three in the race would become the console masters. Uh, the, again, the first three out of nine would become the etcd masters and, and so on. Uh, but there's no distinction at the moment, but these three are targeted as specifically etcd masters and these three are targeted as console masters. Uh, okay. It would be do doable with a parameter. Um, yeah. In terms of separating things, we've try to not break the the current crib workflow. We've maybe not been completely successful, Greg, because I know you fixed some stuff that I uh, uh, accidentally broke. But the idea is that I mean, th this is our workflow here, which which is basically crib with a bunch of extra stuff. So yeah, console server, console, you console agent. Basically use stages instead, right? Effectively. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so 
we've bolted on a bunch of extra stages, which you could optionally add to your workflow if you wanted to, but otherwise just leave them alone and they won't do anything. Um, but yeah, and on a bigger cluster, we can make a new parameter that controls um, mastership. Oh, there's going to be a lot here. Um, and, and lets you specifically target a, a, a console master versus a, a Kubernetes master. So, cool. My question is, what does the configuration look like when you initialize this? Like, for a lot of our use cases, when we talk about testing just a quick crib, we say, throw this profile on with this value, and it'll build a non-HA uh, single master cluster, right? So yes, it's fairly yes. simple. So what is kind of your starting config look like? Uh, we, we build a starting config with Ansible. Uh, and we split that out into a, a JSON and inject that into DRP for our profile, which we call GKC. Uh, you can see it's not simple. <laughs> uh, but that's because, oh, very important that it, it's gotten a whole lot busier now that I, we added a, um, we added an internal registry. So instead of pulling every container from public registries, uh, you know, the, the latest tag or, or whatever it is, we, we want to be able to pin our containers to explicit um, containers by SHA. And so we did the work to, to create a whole bunch of extra parameters, one for every type of container that gets used. So on a new build now, um, if these values are specified, we we don't pull any containers off the internet. Everything gets pulled from our local registry. Uh, the the value being that it's a pre-tested combination of containers, and you, you can be 100% confident that your next build is going to use exactly the same containers that your previous build used, um, because the, the 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 rate of change of of all these um, uh, all these other containers is so fast that we found that even between a reinstall two days later, we'd be getting different code because the yep. metal LP guy has got a new version deployed or Calico has got a new version or something else. And so how do you get stability and how do you know that you've tested something in dev before it goes into prod? So yes, it's big and busy. Um, but we, we create this with a, an Ansible script that, um, we also use the Ansible script to create our uh, reservations. Uh, this is all spat in here through a, uh, an Ansible inventory, uh, which deploys, the reservations and creates the machines and assigns in their profiles. So we don't do any manual clicking around in the GUI. Um, we start an Ansible, uh, we create the environment, boot the machines, um, provided we get the MAC addresses right, which I don't always do, uh, they appear and they're ready to go. Okay, so you pre-create the machines with the MAC addresses for mapping purposes? Yes. Okay. Partly because we, we, we're kind of cheap and we're, we're using machines that don't all have IPMIs um, like Intel looks. And so it's a pain in the butt to go down to the garage to reboot the things and to get them onto the right IP. So the, the more prepared I am in the beginning, uh, the better results I get. Now it's, it's going really well. Um, there was one little trick I had to add to the, the CentOS Pixie install because a CentOS install by default assumes that next time you boot, you're going to want to boot off your hard drive. Um, and so it changes your Pixie boot order, which is a nuisance because then you can't reboot into discover mode. So we, we reverted that in our kickstart so that every machine will always default to Pixie, um, which means we can do a full remote reinstall without having to run downstairs and push buttons. Makes sense. Uh, okay, cool. Very cool. Cool. I'm happy to take questions, but otherwise you guys have got stuff to do, so move on. I, I had a question too. Oh, yeah? Um, so one of one of the things, because I was playing around in these, in the, you did a lot of good work. Thank you. Um, I was able to leverage the container D install when I needed it, um, like with very minimal lift. So that was that was awesome. The the thing that I started bumping into was I wanted to start turning parameters to be secure, um, as because that the platform supports that a lot better now. Um, okay. How? Right, but then I, when I started doing that, I started running into this problem where you have to throw in decode into a whole bunch of places. Um, how how critical do you think it would be to start encrypting some of these using the secure flag on the some of the parameters that we have? We've got a ton of them, I know. Yeah. 
Uh, I don't really understand how that works. I, I know you set a parameter to be secure by setting the password to be password, or, or hide me, I think it was. Um, no, so this is this no, is this yeah. is the change. I started to rip this out, and then everything just like broke in a spectacular way. So that that is, um, I actually want to almost eliminate that hack. That is that is not a secure. Um, Thing at all. It's just a UX hack that keeps you from accidentally showing uh, sensitive data to people. It, right. does, it doesn't actually encrypt the back end. It's sort of like your, your comment about etcd. Digital rebar does have the ability to secure the back end and store data in an encrypted way. Um, and you do that just by turning on the secure parameter for a, the secure field for a parameter definition. Okay. Um, but when you do that, if you then retrieve that parameter it um in a template it'll expand it and decrypt it for you automatically but in the command line you have to add in a um, flag to get the encrypted data oh i see okay um and so to, to actually start encrypting all the parameters every place that we retrieve <laughs> retrieve a parameter we would have to throw in that flag um or change it change the default um so it, it just, it, it felt, it, it looked like a really smart thing to do until I started to do it, and then everything got really complex, so. Well, if the UI, if the template would decode the parameter by itself, wouldn't you want the command line to do the same? No, because the command line may not be running in the context of the machine's token, so you may not want uh, the users right. to always dump it, so. Yeah. You have to be explicit. So, but we're contemplating that change too, because the mm -hmm. common way to get it from the system is used, and you may not use it, or since we haven't necessarily published it, there's a git parameter helper that gets injected with all of the templates that you could call. It's a function. So you say like git parameter, and I give it a parameter name, oh, yeah. and it query it from the system. Um, that's what's missing the dash dash decode in this case. And so we've been debating whether just to add the dash dash decode to that. Um, but. Oh, I see. Yeah. So gentlemen, I'd love to continue the conversation on crib. We've got lots and lots we can talk about. David, you've done a huge amount of work on this. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to more you're doing. And if there's interest and you're willing to come back and show some of the other pieces, we'd love to have you back on again. Uh, in the meantime, I need to move, shift this over because we're running short on time here. And if there are any other questions that come in uh, from the community around the Kubernetes stuff and crib that David has worked on, please uh, drop them in the Slack community channel or hit us up on email or send out smoke signals or however. That's fine. We'd love to get them over to David. Um, he's on the community channel as well, so that would be great. Um, in the meantime, let's shift over to Terraform. So uh, just to set the bar really quick, uh, Digital Rebar Provision has a Terraform uh, provider that allows us to interact with Terraform or more concisely Terraform to interact with Digital Rebar Provision to do Terraformy things with bare metal uh, physical machines through Terraform's concepts of DSL and manipulation of infrastructure. Uh, there are a lot of people that use that, uh, but there have been a number of places where you can cut your fingers pretty badly and um, possibly bleed to death. <laughs> With uh, Terraform V1, uh, the primary issues being state management of your physical infrastructure and having uh, two chiefs in the kitchen cooking or to mix metaphors or something. Uh, and essentially, Terraform tries to do its job, wants to destroy things because state has changed and recreate them. You can have all kinds of problems and, and issues. Um, so there are a lot of other sort of uh, uh, problems and issues um, joining up between uh, digital rebar provisions idea of parameters and typed uh, values for parameters versus what Terraform uh, is able to express. And there's some pretty severe mismatches there that have caused a lot of grief. Um, with that in mind, we've sort of embarked on a version two architecture shift and change for the Terraform provider, and that's what the rest of this discussion is about. Um, Greg or um, Rob, do either you two want to sort of lead off comments or discussion from there? 
<laughs> uh, Rochambeau. Yeah, so the biggest challenge we've had with Terraform and the providers is the state management. And so right now, if you, it seems like there's kind of two basic operations of using Terraform. One is the create destroy pattern where I create it, I use it for what I want, and then I eventually destroy it, but I don't do anything in between with Terraform. I just use it to start. Okay, so that pattern works fine. The, and, and you should feel comfortable and confident using that. Um, the challenge is if you actually believe that you can use Terraform to do secondary updates and actions and other things like that um, with the, the plan file against a DRP instance, uh, then you can get in trouble. In the first pass of the Terraform plugin provider, we've chosen to do um, full object replication. So Terraform state file basically builds up a copy of the state of the object from DRP at the time it takes its actions. The problem is that drifts. And so if you try and reapply a plan after you've done your kind of initial work, that reapply will attempt to set it back to the create state that Terraform recorded, uh, plus or minus anything that you may have done changes wise in your plan. And that causes huge problems because it'll like reset workflows and cause reinstalls potentially and all sorts of stuff because Terraform doesn't have the concept of a normalized state in that regard. This works great for cloud processes and stuff where you are being much more declarative. But if you're doing bare metal, it's harder. So that's that side. Um, as we go forward, what we're looking for is or some guidance or usage patterns of what's, what are you really using Terraform for? Or how are you using it? If it's just create delete, then that's helpful because it helps kind of direct how much effort we put in. If it's more of we want to reapply and reapply and reapply, then we have to think about this in a different way. Our current thoughts are around things like, we're just going to flat out lie to Terraform and give it a fake state effectively, and then have some mapping in the provider that says, well, you said you wanted to do that, but you lie, so we're not going to do that. Um, that's one of the paths. The other question we have around Terraform is, right now, the current Terraform provider lets you manipulate pretty much all of the objects. So you can create profiles and workflows and parameters and all of these things. Um, is that useful? Do you guys use it that way? We've been trying to encourage people to use content packs and upload those. And it makes sense potentially for Terraform to have some way to import content packs and export content packs and stuff like that. But just creating profiles and creating workflows and creating stages just seems overkill on the provider side. So um, the thought was not to do that work in the second version of the provider but to have more of a content pack upload and machine management. Those are really the only two actions that Terraform can take. At least that's the first thought. Um, and then the third thing that the current provider kind of does is this weird lazy pooling system, which allows you to kind of define sets of machines to work with. And it was built before the tenant system and all sorts of other stuff. And so the thought is that that functionality would go away from the provider and move into the actual pool plugin so that you could take advantage of pools that way and the provider just kind of knows to pull from certain pools or not based upon machine parameters. So. That's okay. So that's a, that's a good starting point there. So anyone on the community side here have a vested interest in talking about the Terraform changes we're discussing here? Because we'll just yeah. do it the way we want to do it otherwise. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes. yes. Okay. Matt, welcome. Uh, yeah, this is Matt. I've uh, been talking with Greg to get a, a certain proof of concept up and running for my company. Um, 
or uh, uh, I've actually uh, liked the idea of simplifying the Terraform because I don't think that workflows are going to be uh, as important. Um, I think uh, I'm, I'm using uh, Terraform as a entry point for providers. So I have multiple providers, um, digital rebar provision being one of those providers. And I'm looking for one, um, one way to do things and, and Terraform is the uh, way that I can express my infrastructure on multiple providers in a unified manner. So in that model, what's your expectation for the state of the machine when it's done? Uh, the state of the machine should be ready for uh, a configuration management system to take over. So I'm currently looking at Ansible, but Chef and Puppet are not off the board. Okay, so, well, for each of those, you'll have different access points that you'll need to ensure are in position, right? Yeah, that's right. So if you're doing Ansible, you'll need some shared SSH key. If you're doing Chef or Puppet, you'll need it joined to some external server, right? Or at least an SSH key to run Chef Solo or Puppet Solo or whatever it is. Right, and Terraform will be able to get me to that point. Uh, assuming an SSH key, right? Right, yeah, I, I'll need some way for Terraform to talk to <laughs> the servers and, and then Terraform will be able to get me to the point to where things are joining my uh, Puppet Master or my Chef server. Okay. Uh, and you want to do it with Terraform because that gives you a multi-platform tool. Is that That's the... right. So, so if, if we actually went further down to that it wouldn't be as useful unless you were using the same process on Amazon and Google and VMware. Uh, that, that, is a, that is a goal though, so yeah. Okay. Uh, OpenStack being, you know, the, the one that we're targeting first. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's, um, yeah, that's, um, you don't want to touch the OpenStack comment? It, it's not that, it's actually, it's the cloud API comment and there's, there's a, a whole separate discussion about cloud APIs and, and using telling digital rebar to create and destroy machines like we use for VirtualBox and other cloud providers and, and doing more of that um, would, would allow you to sort of, right, right, with, what, with what we're talking about, you're using Terraform because you're interfaced to the other cloud APIs and you're handing over to another configuration management tool. So you're, you're chaining three tools together um, to create the portability and that's, that's the best, best right now. I, I just want us to do better. Uh, I mean, I don't, uh, I don't necessarily want an all-in-one tool. I, I don't mind that I'm using three different technologies, uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, if, uh, I can get, uh, just a unified process to, uh, get Terraform up and running. And then, uh, like I said, I can, uh, test those multiple providers. Okay. Make sense. And, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then MC Lamb. I mean, that's the way to say that. Um, points out that he wants to use, or she wants to use Terraform for infrastructure changes to add capacity potentially. And so adding capacity means the state file needs to be sane. That is true. So, okay, makes sense. Yeah, I, I'm actually really looking forward to the, the pooling that you guys are talking about for that reason, because it, the pool kind of creates the same sort of pooling that a, a, a provider would have. Yeah. Well, and so for us, the pool plugin allows you to take your create like activities from your, against your bare metal infrastructure, even though a create makes no sense, right? Um, so yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. I'm looking for that separation between you know, the guys managing the hardware and our systems managing the software. So 
our hardware guys can get servers up and running and onto the Pixie or onto DRP. And then uh, that's all they have to worry about is getting it into the pool. And then everything else can pull or, or return to the pool um, in the end, you know? Okay. Uh, so Okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, yeah, and that's part of how the another way we can avoid state drift is that the pool can um, handle some of that abstraction. Right. So. Okay. That was, that was one of the other other challenges with the old design is that we used parameters on the machine, and if there's a state conflict, where Terraform's rewriting parameters on the machine. Um, and the whole thing goes into a, a you know, literal explosion. Uh, I think that would come from misuse of Terraform, honestly. I, I mean, if, you, if you're using Terraform to manage your configurations, uh, you probably aren't using Terraform the way it's designed, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to argue on that. Um, This is awesome. Okay. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? We're at the top of the hour and a tad bit over, but um, if not, we'll wrap things up. And again, I would invite uh, conversations on the Slack Pound community channel. So if you wanted to further follow up with questions or thoughts or comments, we really do value feedback from uh, users, operators, community members uh, of digital rebar provision, your use cases. Uh, it's important for us to try and ensure we're matching and, and mapping all of the capabilities and pieces to, uh, to work <laughs> for your, you and your environment. So please uh, follow up in the Slack Pound community channel. Uh, this is a wrap up on digital rebar provision, community meetup number 40, believe it or not. Uh, we will see you all in two weeks. And we will get a agenda out to you this week for the next meetup. And we'll have some more fun, interesting topics. Until then, provision on. Well said. I fix you up. Thanks, <laughs> Shane. Cheers, everyone.